This panel is titled, Why Now? The Urgency of Advancing Religious Liberty in the Muslim World. In the next hour and a half, we hope to provide a well-rounded discussion of all the relevant elements of this issue, including the political, social, and theological. Some of the questions we hope to answer include, what is the general status of religious liberty in Muslim-majority countries, both democratic and autocratic? In these countries, how significant are deficiencies, as well as positive trends in religious freedom to individuals, religious communities, social harmony, economic development, and political success? What internal resources exist to address these deficiencies or encourage these positive trends? And finally, what is the role, or should be the role, of Muslim Americans in advancing religious freedom in Muslim-majority countries? Joining us on the panel today is Tom Farr, who is a director of the Religious Freedom Project at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and a visiting associate professor of religion and international affairs at Georgetown's Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. We also have Alan Hertzke, who is a, uh, the presidential professor of political science at the University of Oklahoma. He has written extensively on religious advocacy and politics, and in particular, faith-motivated activism and foreign policy. And next to him, we have Ed Hussein, who is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. His work focuses on international threats from radicalization, extremism, and terrorism. And finally, we are joined by Sheikh Hamza Youssef. Uh, in 1996, he founded the Zaytuna Institute, which is committed to presenting a classical picture of Islam in the West and reviving traditional study methods and the sciences of Islam. And I ask uh, that everyone limit their remarks um, to no more than 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm first. Um, first, let me say it's an honor to be here with these colleagues. Uh, I've just met uh, Sheikh Hamza Youssef. It's a real honor to be here with you, uh, with my friends uh, Asma Uden, uh, Alan Hertzke, uh, and uh, Ed Hussein, uh, all of whom have been doing terrific work in, in this field, and uh, we're, we're delighted, I'm speaking on behalf of the Religious Freedom Project, to have all of you here. Um, I think we're just doing this alphabetically. In some ways, I would probably be best bringing up the end here, but because I want to talk a little bit about, uh, as a non-expert in Islam, and certainly uh, some, a student of Islam, uh, I've observed this, the issue of uh, the status of religious freedom in Muslim-majority countries for some years. So my remarks are, are I hope somewhat informed, but they're certainly not that of an expert, uh, someone who is very interested in the issue. And so what I'd like to do is make an argument really of, of a couple of parts. Uh, let me tell you what those parts are, and then I'll come back and fill in the, the gaps a little bit. First of all, uh, religious freedom is severely deficient in many Muslim-majority countries. It's not surprising that, there, that there's very little religious freedom in the authoritarian theocratic countries such as Iran or Saudi Arabia or Sudan. Um, it, we can say the same about non-Muslim majority authoritarian countries such as China or Vietnam. Uh, and certainly uh, during the period of the Soviet Union we saw horrific uh, religious persecution. So it, it's probably, in my view, not terribly fruitful to think about the way that can change because the, the barriers to change in countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Sudan perhaps less than the others because of what's going on there. Uh, I like to talk about those countries and we can certainly do so if people are interested, but I think it's far more interesting and fruitful, potentially fruitful, to speak of the Muslim majority democracies in the world, um, including those uh, that are relatively stable democracies, have been around for a while and, and are successful to one extent or another, such as Turkey and Indonesia. Indonesia, of course, the largest Muslim country in the world and the only large Muslim country that has been ranked free by Freedom House. Most of you or many of you have heard of Freedom House and its uh, rankings of annual rankings of countries is free, partly free or non-free. Indonesia is the only large Muslim majority country. I think there are a couple of others, Mali, perhaps Senegal, that have made that, that rank. But this is the only one of, of true, uh, speaking as an American diplomat, geopolitical significance that has reached that level. And yet, it still has very significant problems with religious liberty. It still um, uh, officially persecutes uh, the Ahmadiyya uh, uh, minority 
it, it has terrific problems, both official and non-official, uh, with uh, sanctioning, or at least, uh, not, if not sanctioning, then acquiescing in the presence of religion-based extremism. Um, similar problems exist in Turkey, uh, although, uh, and so I guess the point I would make on those two countries that are the most mature of the large Muslim uh, uh, democracies is that religious freedom remains a missing link, arguably a, a primary missing link in their movement from democratic proceduralism and, and, and sort of chugging along as democracies that are making some progress uh, to democracies that are truly consolidated. And by that I mean democracies that, that protect the equality of all of their citizens under the law including and especially their religious minorities. Neither Turkey nor Indonesia have gotten there, but they're certainly further along than the, the category of countries that I really want to talk about, and I would call them struggling or nascent democracies within the Muslim-majority world. In particular, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, two countries, uh, for better or worse, in which the United States has been heavily involved for uh, better than a, a decade, and, uh, but also Pakistan and the Arab Spring countries, in particular Egypt. These are countries uh, in which American foreign policy and our, and our own interests, I think it's fair to say however one defines our interests, and we, we may disagree over that, however we define them, the stability of those countries, their, their success in achieving democracy is very important to the United States of America. So here we move beyond, in my view, the, the, some of the philosophical discussions which I found intriguing this morning about religious freedom, and which you'll find in the book uh, that you have, to the second half of the book, which deals with the strategic arguments, if you will, for religious freedom. They are, uh, they are, those arguments in the book are characterized by an American point of view, because Americans wrote them, but we, as we say in part two of the book, we believe these are arguments that can be made by any uh, country in the world that wants stability, wants their neighbors to succeed when they are choosing democracy. And I think that's, Egypt is the country where we can say that most completely. Egypt has chosen democracy. It is struggling toward it. And yet, religious freedom is a major, major issue. And the final point I'll make, and I'll come back at the end to this, is that uh, the United States, as many of you know, has officially had a policy of advancing international religious freedom now since 1998. Uh, I was privileged to be in the office very early during that tenure and, and indeed have spent the last the better part, part of the last decade <coughs> thinking and complaining about uh, the, uh, some of the shortcomings of, of that policy, but uh, complaining from within the fraternity, if you will, or the fraternity slash sorority of of diplomats who really want this to work. Uh, and the reason I want it to work is not only because advancing religious freedom is in the interests, I truly believe, of every country in the world where there is a religious human being, which is every country in the world, but it's also in the interest of our country to do this successfully. Uh, and, and so I want to end up with a couple of remarks on that. Why should Egypt just to take one example, but you can substitute any of these nascent struggling democracies, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq. Why should they want religious freedom? Why should they care about it? Um, because we tell them that it's in their interest? Because uh, the United Nations uh, uh, Declaration and the ICCPR Article 18 and both of those says that, that this is an international norm? Well, sure, those are very important proposition that I think any self-respecting democracy wants to, uh, to try to adhere to international norms and international law when they can. But it seems to me that, uh, you know, we, we've been doing international law and international human rights now for well over half a century. Um, I, I'm not sure that we've ever had, since the end of the Holocaust and the end of the Second World War, more fidelity in word and less fidelity in deed internationally to religious freedom. And this is true in particular of countries like Egypt. Why should they adopt it? In my view, the answer is because you're not going to get what you want if you don't. It's an argument to self-interest. If, in fact, your goal, as some would attribute to the Muslim Brotherhood, is to uh, you know, just get power and move toward a caliphate, this argument doesn't work. 
uh, if in fact their goal is simply to gain control of Egypt and abrogate the Camp David Accords and, and, uh, and, and create some kind of radical Islamist movement, uh, then, then I acknowledge that this argument is not uh, terribly fruitful. And, and it's no mistake that people who believe that to be the case in Egypt uh, are not terribly receptive to the argument that, that, I, that I make, which is an argument about American national security. It's an argument that we want Egypt to succeed and the other countries, but they won't do it unless they can get this religion-state relationship right. It doesn't mean the First Amendment. It doesn't mean the, certainly doesn't mean the separation of church and state. I was interested in Bill McClay's discussion of his uh, you know, being pressed on this when he went around Turkey. Um, the separation of church and state is to me the wrong way to appeal to Muslims in Muslim majority countries about the way that they should do their religious state balance. The way we should convey to them our interest in their success is that the United States, while it has an institutional separation of church and state, has not removed religion for politics, from politics, as much as some, I believe, harking back to what Tim Shaw said at the end of the last panel, some earnestly would like it to happen because it causes problems for domestic politics, as we heard from the last panel. But religion has always been in the American democratic experiment. The notion that it shouldn't be involved in politics, even if it were a good idea, which I personally think it isn't, is nonsense. It's not part of the, why do you suppose we have a First Amendment protecting the free exercise of religion? It's not the free exercise of contraception, folks, sorry. It's the free exercise of something that the founders considered to be important. This we can say to the Egyptians. We can say to them, hey, we're not here to ask you to move Islam out of the public square. We're not here to tell you that religious freedom means the expulsion of Islam to the margins of politics. We're here to tell you that we've persecuted our own. By the way, I'm not sure it's been remarked, but the picture on this, the front of our book, is Mary Dyer. This is not a Muslim woman. This is not a, uh, this was a Christian woman, a Quaker, who was hanged on Boston Commons in 1660 for proselytizing the Quaker faith. We've persecuted our own. We're not perfect. I would argue we have the best system of religious liberty in the world. Witness these discussions. But my real point is that we have an opportunity to speak to the self-interest of other countries, especially Muslim-majority countries, not by arguing in a French style. Forgive me, I always have to bash France at least once. But here it is. The French don't understand this. But Muslim-majority countries think that when we're promoting religious freedom in their country, we're French. That what we mean is the expulsion of religion from the public square. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so in sum, what we ought to be doing, I know I'm speaking in great generalities. You're welcome to press me. I'll be more specific. But I'm painting with a broad brush so that I can stop talking. I want to get to US foreign policy briefly. We need to make arguments, not just with diplomats, but with programs, with money, with American foreign policy that says to these countries, we can help you, not just by putting you on a list and condemning you, not just by writing reports about religious freedom, but by un helping you to understand how you will not succeed at democracy building if you don't succeed at religious freedom. If every, con every individual in Egypt, no matter what their religious belief is, does not have full equality under the law, to worship and to act on the basis of their religious beliefs within the norms of democratic discourse, then Egypt will not succeed as a democracy. Final point. We haven't done a very good job of this in American foreign policy. For reasons, for many reasons, one of which I think Tim Shaw hit well upon. Let me paraphrase it in less elevated terms cluelessness about religious freedom. Some of it is our political elite. It's just garden variety, aggressive secularism. 
They haven't darkened the door of a mosque or a synagogue or a church, and they find puzzling, maybe they're bemused at those who do. Okay, fair enough. I say at the Foreign Service Institute when I speak to my friends, my, diplomat, my diplomatic friends, who, some of whom I know are, are lapsed Catholics or atheists or whatever, and it's impolite to ask, and I don't know, but I know they're there. I say, it doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are. Your job is to engage the world in defense of American interests, and the world is religious. Get over it. You're not going to succeed in advancing religious freedom unless you understand the cultures that you're going into and can bring those cultures to understand that religious freedom doesn't mean leaving your religion at the public, at the door. It does mean that you have to accept some hard compromises. No anti-blasphemy laws. No anti-apostasy laws. You can't kill people because they leave your faith. You don't have to be happy about it. You don't have to celebrate it. But you can't use the force, the police powers of the state to prevent people from leaving Islam or any other. It took the Catholic Church a while to understand that. But it has come to understand that. It embraces religious freedom for all people. But mind you, and let me say this to my Muslim friends, the Catholic Church does not argue. It doesn't matter whether you leave Catholicism or not. It doesn't argue that we don't really care if you're Catholic. Please become a Baptist if you feel better about that. No. It continues to argue that the Catholic Church is the fullest expression of the, of the truth. But as Robbie George said so eloquently today, it defends the right of human beings to do this on their own. If we can get Muslim-majority countries to accept that, then I think we will have done a great deal. I, I said it finally several times here, and I know Asma doesn't believe me, but this really is fine. The current, all the administrations that have had religious freedom, Clinton and then Bush for eight years and now President Obama, I think have failed to grasp this, and I've said this consistently throughout. I think they have not given enough resources to the Office of Religious Free Freedom, which was created in 1998. It has not given enough status to the ambassador at large. It's about positions. It's been true of every one of them. They're buried bureaucratically. We don't train our Foreign Service officers sufficiently to do this. Now, let me say this about the Obama administration. And I, I haven't said a lot of positive things in print about it, but it has instituted in the Foreign Service Institute training that has not existed before on the issues of religion and religious freedom. I hope that they'll take the next step and make it mandatory for Foreign Service officers so it isn't viewed as this niche issue. And you go to that course if you can, if you have time. So in sum, Muslim majority countries have deficiencies in religious freedom. All of them do. Those that are struggling for democracy, we have an opportunity to reach by making a simple point. You won't get what you want. You won't succeed at what you want if you don't get this right. We have a history with this that, that makes us understand the difficulties and the importance of it. Let's have a conversation about religious freedom and how it can help you, and by so doing, help American national interests. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I took 15 minutes, so you get five. Okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> I'm watching my clock. Um, when Tim asked me to serve on this panel and then I saw who the panelists were, I thought, why am I here? I'm, on a, I'm, I'm really humbled to be on a panel with distinguished individuals that I have admired from afar and finally get to meet. And, um, uh, and I guess the reason I'm here is that as a political scientist who started his career studying religion and politics in America, uh, and then evolved into someone concerned really with global religion and religious freedom. I've spent really, and I was telling my students, I teach a class on global religion and American foreign policy at the University of Oklahoma, and I told my students the other day, you know, for the past decade, I've read more, interviewed, I've read more about Islam, I've interviewed more Muslims, I've been inspired by more Muslim heroes of conscience than any other arena 
involved with religion and global politics. So in a sense, as, as someone who's come to this, I come with a fresh perspective, perhaps, and also as a political scientist. So what is the status of religious liberty in uh, Islamic societies around the world? Well, Tom has alluded to this. It's parlous. Uh, the, uh, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life has issued two major reports, one in 2009, one just recently, uh, on uh, the, uh, uh, the status of religious freedom around the world, both in terms of government restrictions and in terms of social hostilities that repress religious exercise. Uh, and in their first report, the five of the top ten countries in government restrictions were Islamic societies, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Maldives, Malaysia. Uh, and in social hostilities, uh, a number of the top countries uh, were Islamic societies, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Somalia, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and one of the most sort of telling um, findings of their report was that on this, what they call the social hostilities index, the, the index of the degree to which social hostilities and violence in society uh, uh, religiously infused really uh, present a chilling environment. The Middle East and North Africa was at 4.4, and the closest region next was 1.7. So it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. And the most recent report on rising restrictions around the world found that among countries where there have been rising restrictions, either to government policies or social hostilities, um, uh, a number of countries are Islamic uh, societies, Egypt, Algeria, Malaysia, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, uh, which is not to say there aren't many factors involved here. But one of the things the report does, uh, which I think is helpful, uh, the most recent report on rising restrictions on religion at the Pew Forum, is it looks specifically at laws on blasphemy, apostasy, and defamation of religion, and how they affect a chilling uh, atmosphere for religious freedom. And here are a couple of the findings. Of the 44 countries in the world that have anti-blasphemy laws, and enforced penalties, 59% had higher, very high restrictions on religion or hostilities. But 15 countries that have such laws but do not even enforce them, they also, 60%, have high restrictions or hostilities on religion. Uh, and then of the rest of the countries that do not have anti-blasphemy laws and so forth, uh, only 17% have high restrictions on religion. So they found significantly a close correlation between having laws against blasphemy, apostasy, and defamation are predictive of restrictions on religion, either governmentally or in terms of society. So we do have, it is clear that there's, there's a challenge here. What is the role then of religious freedom in the future, the fate of Islamic societies around the world? I would argue, argue it's urgent and it's pivotal. Uh, we have great empirical data, quantitative data, on the close correlation between the protection of religious freedom and other aspects of democratic consolidation, civil liberties, women's status, um, <clears throat> rule of law, um, limits on state power, uh, educational success, and so forth. So the fate of aspiring Islamic societies is very much bound up, the flourishing of those societies with regimes that protect the, the, the rights of people to uh, practice their faith and exercise their faith. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty well established. But I think the more interesting and compelling narrative to me is that protecting religious freedom fully, uh, what Robbie George was calling a, uh, in full uh, this morning, um, protecting religious freedom is actually pivotal to the Islamic faith itself. And I don't draw this conclusion on my own. I draw it from people that I have come to admire who are uh, deeply embedded in the Islamic uh, discourse and, and world um, for a variety of historical forces, historical factors, authoritarianism, colonial legacies, uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, a variety of historical factors 
Islamic societies in the 20th century came in many cases to be ruled by authoritarian regimes that were, or were, were repressive or were theocratic. Um, and what it is clear, it's clear that that legacy presents a chilling environment for the free exercise of exploration of Islamic faith and identity. And I'll get back to what I think the, the unique role of American Muslims is at the end. But classic Islamic scholarship de depended upon reason and inquiry and exploration and discourse and debate and dialogue. Um, if, if you read the classic Islamic scholars, the learning is, is just so rich and rewarding. Well, today, Islamic scholars in many societies flee because they can be charged either by the state or by societal actors, radicals, and so forth with apostasy or blasphemy. Um, and so there's a chilling environment for academic pursuit, for freedom, for free inquiry, and most important, for the free submission to the will of Allah. How can you be a true Muslim if you don't voluntarily submit? Isn't that the inherent nature of, you know, and to all of us who are believers, I mean, how, how can you be, uh, how can you have an ascent to the divine unless that is truly free, freely given, not coerced, um, and so forth. And as I look at some of the people that I've gotten to know or have read, uh, it's interesting how much they are making this case that to be a, that to be an authentic Muslim requires the free will assent to the divine. And then in repressive societies, that is very difficult or perilous. And so you look at someone like Abu Sa'id in Egypt, who had to, a great Islamic scholar who had to flee in order to make his case that there are forms of modern scholarship that can be helpful in understanding uh, the Islamic tradition. Uh, you have people like uh, Abdullah Saeed, who makes the case against apostasy laws from an Islamic perspective, that how can you have true free will offering if, if um, uh, you can be charged uh, with blasphemy or apostasy. Um, and certainly, uh, Ed Hussein and Hamza Yusuf have made arguments about the importance of the freedom in Islam to reach you know, the depths of that tradition. Andalusia or, or uh, whatever it may be. Uh, the person I want to highlight uh, is, uh, is um, a great Iranian dissident, Abdul Karim Sarush, um, who uh, uh, has written numerous letters to the uh, regime uh, challenging in Iran, challenging its repression of its people. And if you read his great work on the freedom of religion in Islam and, and, and the connection between freedom of religion and democracy, uh, what you find is a notion that faith must be free. So Rush's argument is that the nature of faith itself is, has to be free. Um, and therefore, regimes that repress that, coerce it, deny it, are actually denying something fundamental about what it means to be a human being or what it means to be an authentic Muslim. That faith must be free. Well, when we look at the situation in some Islamic societies today, we see how government policies or societal movements uh, are uh, repressing that inherent freedom. If you look at the situation in Pakistan, the, the, the harsh blasphemy law was not enacted by democratic procedures. It was, a, it was enacted by General Zia uh, as, a, as, a, as a strategic device to, to you know, kind of arm, uh, wrap himself with the, the Islamic mantle. But once that law is in place, it presents a chilling impact on free inquiry, women's status, minority rights, uh, the ability of Muslims to explore their own faith, um, because it's not only that someone can be accused of blasphemy by the, by the state, but more likely 
by a neighbor who resents you, by someone who wants something you have. Uh, and, and vigilante activity is actually one of the most repressive aspects. And of, of course, the assassination of Shabazz Bhatti uh, is an example of that. Or in Afghanistan, where journalists, women's rights advocates, and others have, uh, have been accused of apostasy and blasphemy, or in some cases um, uh, uh, expelled or, or chased out of the society. And in that sense, I, I echo what Tom said, that the, the, the test, in a way, of the Arab Spring the test of the great aspirations that so inspired many of us really is whether these societies will embrace religious freedom in full. Uh, because that will not only protect religious minorities, Coptic Christians, Ahmadis, Shias, and so forth, but will protect the ability of Muslim thinkers and students and others to explore their faith fully. How can a faith be truly mature if it can't question itself? And how can you question yourself if you will be accused of blasphemy, apostasy, and so forth? <clears throat> and in a way, it's very interesting to look at the different trajectories of, of two very similar societies and how the embrace of religious freedom was transformative. And I like to use the example of Saudi Arabia versus Qatar. Um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are both Gulf states, both Sunni majority states, societies, which for 1400 years had very similar trajectories, faith backgrounds, and so forth. But the society, the Emir in Qatar, made a, a decision. And in a sense, in conversation with a very enlightened American ambassador who understood and deeply respected Islamic culture, to allow religious, Christian religious worship in this case, in, in, in Doha. And the first Catholic church and Protestant church were built there and allowed there. And what's interesting is that that act, I think, was actually pivotal in helping that small, you know, that small kingdom become a player in terms of uh, you know, international discourse and business and universities. And I think there's a Brookings Institution that's centered there now. And there's, there's sort of a flourishing intellectual, social, business life, in part because there was a strategic decision made. Um, and I think it's pretty safe to say that that's a dramatic comparison to the state of Saudi Arabia. But the, the final thing I want to say about this is that going back to Sarush in Iran, is that um, when Sarush wrote his angry letters during the, 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 the protest in Iran during the election, and he basically said um, that this regime was undermining faith in religion and faith in Islam, because by using naked power to stay in power, military force, thugs, and so forth, to undermine the will of the people, the clerics in Iran were actually undermining, traducing, in a sense, faith in their religious leadership. Who really believes these are really devout religious men, in a sense, after what they had to do? This is Sarush's point. Um, so in a way, he was saying, to coerce religion in the Islamic world is to stigmatize it, to undermine it. Um, and so there's not only good strategic reasons for the United States, in a sense, to promote religious freedom, but um, we can do so with good faith of, of Muslim societies around the world that we're, in a sense, upholding something central to the faith. That gets me to the final point about policy. There are many things we could discuss and other points that have been discussed, but what I would like to say is that in terms of what we in the West, either as academics, think tanks, foundations, or American government can do, we can defend and uphold the heroes of conscience in the Islamic world. People who are at great sacrifice and personal risk, sometimes their very lives and livelihoods, making a case for freedom of conscience from a deeply Islamic perspective. They are my heroes. They are the people that I feel uh, akin to, in a sense. And to the extent that we can provide a megaphone, we can uphold that, and we can help them fight the bullies who would intimidate, uh, who would chill, and silence voices of conscience, we ought to do so. 
We should not sit by while people of conscience uh, around the world are at least not being uh, 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 upheld and uh, celebrated for what they're doing. Uh, to allow bullies to chill and intimidate and silence them uh, is, is to undermine ultimately uh, the aspirations of people all over the world. Uh, and that's partly why I think, getting to the last point about Muslim Americans, why I think Muslim Americans will, are and will be some of the best ambassadors for this vision of freedom of religion within Islam and the idea that freedom, that faith must be free to be authentic because Muslim Americans are living that experience and can speak to it around the world. Uh, and once again, I think we have not been very adroit at drawing upon the resources of our own citizens in our foreign policy, and I wish we would do so. Thank you. Thank you, and um, much like Alan, I also feel daunted on being uh, on this panel, but if anyone here knows anything about Tom, you can say many things to Tom, but you can't say no to him. Um, <laughs> I, I try to squeeze myself out of this one, but um, I had to delay my flight to London to be uh, speaking here today, but I don't want to say much, and I really want to hand over my time to Sheikh Hamza and give him more time to speak to many of the themes that have been raised today, and much of what I wanted to say has already actually been referred to by both Tom and Alan in terms of policy prescriptions and developments in the, uh, in, the, in the Middle East at the moment. But before handing over to Sheikh Hamza, I just want to say something somewhat personal in, in the same vein as Tim Shah, and also in the vein that the task force's publication opens up with personal stories. Um, I remember being 19 in uh, a summer camp in, in, in the shires of England, and uh, waking up in that summer camp, I think about at 10 o'clock in the morning, and hearing the voice of, a, of an erudite American Muslim scholar who questioned the very fundamentals that my generation of Muslims who had been born and raised in England went to university in most European countries and the narrative that we had embraced that somehow it was our own personal religious duty Fardain, to advocate an Islamic state or a caliphate that would be A, confrontational towards the West, B, suppress religious minorities' rights along the lines that were suggested earlier, C, confront Israel, D, obliterate democracy, and you know, the, 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 the stereotypes that we hear were the kind of uh, uh, the mindset that my generation of Muslims had embraced. But that morning I woke up to a Muslim scholar coming out in black and white terms, and this is in 1997, well before 9-11, saying that, the, 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 that within the Muslim tradition there was no such thing called the Islamic State, that in early Muslim history it was referred to as Had al-Amr, or this affair, Sheikh Hamza will speak more, more to these themes, but that Muslim scholar, for me as a 19-year-old, that questioned that narrative of extremism that leads ultimately to terrorism, of separatism, of negating religious pluralism, that Muslim scholar was Sheikh Hamza. 9-11 um, happened, and I remember looking around the Muslim scene, both in Europe and the broader West, but also in Muslim-majority countries, the voice that came out most clearly uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 and said, that the 19 men who were involved in the plane hijackings weren't martyrs but were murderers was against Sheikh Hamza. And I remember seeing him in England at the time and the personal threats that he had faced for taking that line boldly and several other lines that led to hardliners within the Muslim communities feel upset by his intellectual clarity and, uh, and spiritual wisdom and also commitment to the truth, capital T truth, in what he advocated. I then went on to live in the Middle East. I mean, I was in Syria for two years, Saudi Arabia for about a year, and you spoke about the need for Muslim American ambassadors. I remember going to sermons, both in Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah on Fridays, but before I would go to pray at, the, at, at these mosques and you know, different Fridays on, on NBC, which is a very popular Arab uh, television channel from Saudi Arabia, and almost everyone on the Friday morning at home in Saudi Arabia watches that uh, channel. There was Sheikh Hamza on a program called Rihla Ma Sheikh Hamza being beamed into 300 million Arab homes in which he was taking delegations of Muslims and others to the Library of Congress and other buildings and showing them the dedication to Islamic civilization on the dome of the Library of Congress that was directly being beamed into Muslim homes in Saudi Arabia. You know, so if you want a public a vo a intellectual and if you want a Muslim voice in the US that's having an impact on the ground and changing an entire generation of Muslims in Europe, you have him here, so over to Sheikh Hamza. I didn't pay him to <laughs> say that. 
<laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I appreciate that uh, testimony. That period of time was an incredibly difficult time for me and my family. You know, I had the uh, FBI coming, telling me to put like alarm systems in my house, and uh, because they were getting all this chatter about people uh, wanting to kill me, which was very strange. But um, you know, Martin Luther King, at the height of his, um, and I'm not comparing myself in any way, but I'm just talking about death threats in general. He was getting about 300 a day, uh, so it's not surprising he was a chain smoker and. Uh, <laughs> other vices um, that tend to uh, afflict a lot of people under an intense amount of pressure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I want to first say just on a personal note, and I appreciated Mr. Shaw's remark about that. Um, in some ways, I, I'm here because of religious persecution, because one of my great-grandfathers fled Scotland because of the Catholic persecution, uh, and so he ended up over here on this shore. So, um, and then my, uh, my great-great-grandfather uh, came to Philadelphia from Scotland as an, uh, from Ireland as an Irish Catholic and in 1838 and in, within a few years they were burning down the churches in, in, uh, in Philadelphia and although somebody mentioned that it was mobs doing that, the fact is a lot of the, the authorities were turning the other eye when these things happened. I mean, we tend to forget the complicity often of governments in mob violence and that was something very evident recently in Egypt. Uh, where they allowed these mobs, who were actually government thugs, under the guise of being uh, mobs. So that often occurs also. But, uh, you know, my, my own Irish Catholic uh, roots, my name is Hansen, but it's actually O. Hansen. Uh, so they dropped the O and pretended not to be Irish because there was an uh, ethnic backlash against Irish Catholics, not Ulster uh, Irish, right? Not Protestant Irish. It was very different being a Protestant Irish in this country. But we're here. Uh, next to uh, Maryland, where Lord Baltimore, I mean, we have uh, the first uh, really religious edict of toleration in the United States, even though it was very limited in its scope, uh, recognizing Trinitarian uh, differences within the community. But it was here. And then Thomas Jefferson right next door in Virginia uh, with the uh, toleration in the state of Virginia and arguing in, in a letter that he wanted to see an America that was safe for... Uh, the Christian, the Jew, the Mohammedan, the Hindu. I mean, I was quite stunned to find him mentioning the Hindu uh, when I first read that many years ago, and the atheist also. So um, uh, it's very interesting because the atheist, I mean, in the previous panel, somebody mentioned about, uh, you know, there's no religion of one, and I, I think that's arguable. I mean, every religion begins with one person. So Jesus, at one point, was the only Christian around and the Prophet Muhammad was the only Muslim at one point. So religion begins with one. And uh, Jefferson, to quote him again, I'm staying in the Monticello Hotel over there, so uh, it must be affecting me. But Jefferson also said, I am a sect of one. So I think he uh, relished that idea. And in, in the West, I think individualism has been so prominent in, in, uh, in, in modern Western uh, tradition, whereas in the East, you still have much more of a communitarian uh, uh, society. So if you go to these societies, the community is very important. And I, and I lived with, um, with uh, Bedouin, for, and I spent seven years with uh, Bedouin. So I, I got to really understand the pre-modern tribal mentality, which is a very interesting mentality, because on the one hand, they have a lot of egalitarian qualities, and they're, they're actually quite democratic in, in many ways. This was in West Africa, in Mauritania. But, but on the other hand, it's very difficult to split off from the tribe. I mean, they all have eccentric, eccentric uncles, uh, like the, you know, the English tolerate the eccentric uh, Englishman in the family. Um, so I think eccentricity has always been tolerated at the individual level. But when, you, when one half of the group breaks off from the other half, and it really creates an immense amount of trauma in a society. And I think this is, uh, we're dealing with some really profound and problematic issues in this issue, especially when you look at the Muslim countries. If you want to look at the state of the Muslim countries, I mean, they have some of, you know, I have a, a uh, um, when I, I found out that Nigeria, they do these corruption indices, and Nigeria was number one uh, in the world for corruption, and, and number two was Pakistan, but a Pakistani friend of mine said actually Pakistan was number one, but they bribed Nigeria to take number two, <laughs> number one position. So 
uh, I, I think the, you know, the, Muslim, the Muslim countries certainly uh, immense amount of dysfunctionality, but I think we would, it's, it's really important to remember first and foremost, we, we sit in our smugness very often in the West and, and not remember the fact that we have been through immense religious uh, wars to get to where we are. I mean, we forget how much blood was shed to, to hear breathe free and be able to sit up here on this panel and talk about things. Much of that was done by people that were actually trying to mitigate the influence of religion in society, many of them free thinkers, people that would go under the category of the, uh, the uh, t uh, in, our, in our culture of pain, for instance, who ends up getting kind of booted out after the revolution's over, even though he started it, uh, him and Patrick Henry, and they both get marginalized. But uh, the, you know, the free thinkers often end up somewhere else. So it, you know, when you look at the Muslim world, Wolfgang Smith, who I think is probably one of the most important uh, uh, intellectuals uh, alive, uh, brilliant mathematician, but also a brilliant uh, uh, religious philosopher, you know, argues that the Muslims have yet, and the Hindus and the Buddhists, have yet to really confront modernity. I mean, we tend to forget the, the Quran is, has a geocentric worldview, and yet geocentricity has never really been a debate in the Muslim community after heliocentricity became the dominant. It just wasn't a debate, whereas, as we know here, this was a massive traumatic event in Western civilization. So in a lot of ways, the ideas of religious freedom are, are, are on the one hand, from a pre-modern sense, they're, they're very much part of the Islamic ethos and culture because Muslims, one of the things they pride themselves on is that when the Christian sects and things were being persecuted in Europe, they had the millet system, uh, the, you know, the Jews were being uh, welcomed into uh, Morocco, were being welcomed into Istanbul, Constantinople. If you go to the incredible uh, Jewish uh, synagogues that were actually built by the Ottomans in Ottoman style that we find in, in, in the Ottoman uh, areas where the Jews uh, lived, in, in which is now Eastern Europe. So I think we tend to forget you know, how much religious freedom was very, very important to the Muslim community. It's also ironic that a religion that was founded uh, in its first 10 years, because it has a 23-year history, I mean, this is, this is the, you know, every Muslim knows these 23 years, if they have any devotional status in their religion, they know these 23 years intimately. The first 13 years were years of religious persecution. The Prophet Muhammad and his followers were persecuted terribly with, uh, with uh, women, uh, a famous woman, Sumeya, was, her vagina was pierced with a spear. And this is part of the foundational story of the Muslims. Uh, so th the fact that a religion that could, could begin uh, understanding the pain of, of religious persecution and then end up unfortunately having adherents that become uh, uh, persecutors themselves, I mean, is, is deeply troubling. In, in the Muslim world, I would argue that a, a lot of what, what Muslims um, see today, what's going on, this does not represent the majority of Muslims. I think the Muslims are deeply troubled by Christian churches being attacked or bombed. Uh, all the ones that I know certainly do, and I've spent a good deal of time in the Muslim world. Um, uh, the Iraqi community, these are ancient communities. How did they survive for centuries if this was the norm in the Muslim world? How did the Jewish community in Morocco survive for centuries if this was the norm? Yemeni, the, the Jews only recently had to leave Yemen because the government, it was getting so difficult to protect them anymore from this kind of religious extremism. I think uh, in the opening remarks that were made, uh, not not uh, 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 Robert George's, but in the opening remarks that were made about how we're seeing with the religious persecution a rise of religious extremism, I think that's putting the, the, uh, the carriage before the horse. It's the religious extremism that is causing this type of persecution. And I think one of the, one of the things that a lot of people in the West have no idea about is the fact that uh, Muslim scholars in many Muslim countries can't open their mouths unless they go along the party line of the, the, the official line. I mean, in the West, we have Marx's famous statement that religion is the opiate of the masses. In a lot of the Muslim-majority countries, religion has been the sledgehammer of the governments. I mean, they have literally imposed upon 
uh, people a certain view uh, of religion, which is basically you do what we say, and if you go against us, uh, you will suffer the consequences. So I think a lot of Muslims are waiting to breathe free. I think in terms of um, US foreign policy, first of all, we've lost so much moral capital uh, in, in, in of recent uh, you know, uh, problems in, in the region. An immense amount of moral capital has been lost. And so it's very difficult for us to speak, especially at the State Department level. Uh, it sounds very hollow. And I'm just telling you what you will hear on the ground in, in Muslims, and I do my own anecdotal surveys whenever I get into taxis, I always ask them, you know, what do you think of this, that, or the other? And I get amazing answers. Taxi drivers are some of the most un uh, underestimated analysts in the world. <laughs> but, uh, and just go to New York and, you know, you'll find out. So a lot of them have PhDs now because they're unemployed uh, in, th in that field, so they end up driving a cab. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always struck by, um, you know, the critical awareness and the sophist political sophistication of a lot of these people. And, and then also, at the same time, you see a kind of absolute madness in their analysis. So I would say that in terms of the United States, uh, you know, supporting religious freedom, I think it's important, but I think it needs to be divorced from the idea of creating them in our own image. Uh, you have to realize that we have centuries of, of religious wars. Uh, most Muslims view this uh, as a type of crusader mentality, that we're going to uh, recreate you in our, in our own image. They also, many of the Muslims, and I, I, I want to speak completely frank, you know, many of the Muslims see this as a Trojan horse um, for religious proselytization, that if we can get religious freedom, then it'll bring in the missionaries, and then uh, we can convert them to Christianity. I mean, this is, uh, this is the thinking along the lines of this, and that's why I think uh, to answer the third question, the importance of the American Muslim community. Again, full disclosure, as somebody who was raised, I mean, my father uh, came out of Columbia. He taught the uh, great books. He was a philosophy and humanities professor. So I grew up in this uh, you know, culture of more training your mind to think and be open-minded. My mother was, even though she was uh, half Greek and, and then she had Irish roots on the other half, but she was baptized in the Greek Orthodox tradition. I was baptized Greek Orthodox, but raised uh, in Catholic schools. So she raised us, this is typical Northern California 60s, 70s uh, upbringing, to be very open-minded. She used to tell us, you know, look, the only reason we're this religion is because I was born in this family. And so the, the arbitrariness of religious faith is something very weird that we all have to acknowledge as human beings, that if we were in Sri Lanka, we might be Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims, you know. And so the family that you grow up in often determines the religion. And so I'm very aware of that aspect of indoctrination just in my own children. Like, I'm indoctrinating them. And they believe everything I say. And it's deeply troubling for me as somebody very committed to free thinking and yet at the same time deeply committed to my faith. You know, so I, I struggle with these issues in my own house. Because uh, young children are just, you know, they'll believe in Santa Claus if you tell them Santa Claus exists. They'll believe, and, and Dawkins would argue, exactly. And this is how religion uh, uh, regenerates in each generation, because the big Santa Claus is going to give us all the gifts when we die is part of that indoctrination. I mean, obviously, as somebody who, who is, is, is committed to the Islamic faith, I'm very aware of the problems inherent in this very issue. Um, somebody said about Jordan not giving, having, uh, you know, dishing out the, uh, the khutbas. Trust me, the khutbas used to be uh, actually uh, left to the scholars to give. When I first went to the Muslim world, the scholars were giving their own khutbas. And then when, as the radicalization began to emerge and you got these complete insane people giving uh, khutbas, and, and creating this total uh, subversive element within these societies. And I think one of the, uh, the panelists in the last session talked about this, you know, the, the goods of religious freedom is a good, but it's not the only good. And that social stability is another good. These are really profound problems in these societies. Um, 
in, in, in the United Arab Emirates, which is a very open-minded society, we look at the United Arab Emirates as being like a, a completely controlled society, and yet in terms of the Gulf states, there's no state that, that allows Western people to be Western, to go to their churches. I was actually brought in as an advisor uh, because some of the scholars, I'm, I'm finishing up right now, so yeah, I'm, I'm very aware of that. They say don't give an imam a microphone and don't give a woman a telephone in the Arab countries, right? So um, that's an Arab joke. People aren't laughing. <laughs> It's like sexism. That's another issue we have to deal with, which is a major issue in the Muslim countries. So these are, you know, we're not going to solve the world's problems in 10 minutes. It usually takes me 20, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll accept uh, the time limit. So I would say the American Muslim community, I think, is one of the best assets that we have. I've been asked by the State Department to go around the Muslim world, and I'm telling them, look, you know, leave me alone. I mean, if you want to kill any credibility that I have, it's to go as a State Department representative overseas, you know, because now, I mean, when I, when I first spoke out against 9-11 uh, for Al Jazeera, I was on Al Jazeera, one of the things uh, came in, when did the CIA start producing imams, right? So this is what we're dealing with. Anyway, sorry for any overtime. But I did have some of my time given to me. Uh, Sheikh Hamza, I'm sorry to cut you short. Uh, I just know I've been to many, many lectures by, by the Sheikh, and I know that he always goes over time. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and on that end, actually, I wanted to echo Ed as well. Um, growing up Muslim American, I had quite a few conflicts, um, internal conflicts that I dealt with, and Sheikh Hamza actually played a huge role um, in helping me come to terms with that. Um, so I just want to give, you know, the Sheikh did make a couple of points uh, to contest the stuff that Tom said, so I want to give him a couple minutes to, to rebut. Well, I didn't take them as rebutting what I said at all. Yeah, I took them you. as confirming what I said, and that is that the United States shouldn't be wagging its finger at the Muslim world, but should be making arguments to the self-interests of, of Muslims. Uh, I completely agree, and have written it at some length, that uh, we are perceived precisely have used the, the phrase Trojan horse as a, uh, uh, our religious freedom policy in particular is often perceived as Trojan horse for Western missionaries, Christian missionaries, and also for sort of moving Islam out of the way. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I say I almost wish this were true. Uh, I, I, I think it is giving, as foreigners often do, far too much credit uh, to the State Department um, and, uh, and to uh, American administrations to think that they could cook up such a scheme, uh, or the CIA. Um, the fact is, I think I come back to Tim Shaw's point earlier. It's often a matter of cluelessness and 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 a lack of intent on the issue of religious freedom. So my response to to what the Sheikh has said, I, I'd really like to pick up on. He he was making it in a different context. He was saying social stability is a good as well, and I would add economic opportunity, right. security, the things that human beings want. The, one of the points I was trying to make in my earlier comments is that I really believe that there's plenty of evidence in the work of Brian Grimm and many others, as well as history, to suggest that if you are a highly religious society and if you want democracy, that includes social stability, economic opportunity, security, harmony, etc., peace with the neighbors, uh, you've got to have religious freedom. And, and so uh, my criticism of American foreign policy is that we haven't seen it that way. We've seen it as just this, uh, this finger wagging that we do. And so we, don't, we aren't on top of being perceived as, uh, you know, I mean, we talk about this all the time, by the way. I mean, if you walked into the State Department, in my opinion, and we can hear maybe from uh, Victoria and, and uh, Ambassador Johnson Cook, but if you walk into the State Department and say that our religious freedom policy is perceived as a, as a Trojan horse for Christian missionaries, you will receive a great deal of assent. People will say, that's right. They wouldn't fight you about it. And they, but secretly, some of them are saying, which is precisely why we shouldn't be doing this. We should be staying away from this. It's none of our business. We should leave these countries alone, uh, if there's a reason for us to get into the religious freedom business, it's humanitarian. People are being hurt, okay? 
the problem with that, which with, I agree with that. I mean, you know, we, I think there's a case to be made the United States should be standing with persecuted, whether it's religious or other. Um, but there are no policy tentacles to that argument. I've heard presidents make you know, magnificent speeches. In fact, every president that I've served under has made magnificent speeches, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. Um, actually, I haven't served under President Obama, but he's made magnificent speeches too. The point is, they're words. The policy tentacles of that empathy with people that are suffering has to be changed into strategies and programs. And to me, the answer is either stay out of it, it's too hard, or if you're going to advance religious freedom, you have to do it in a way that hooks into the desire of Muslims like every other people. And by the way, every Muslim country is different. Talking about Egypt and the Arab Spring as if all these countries are the same, of course nobody here is doing that, it is a mistake. We have to have a strategy in every country if we want to succeed and to understand the religious demography, the religious landscape, the arguments that would be successful. The people that Sheikh Hamza talked about, the, the Muslim scholars in these countries who can't speak out, if they do, they'll, they'll get in trouble. They'll be accused of blasphemy. I like to tell the story, you perhaps have heard of the journalism student in Afghanistan who wrote a paper uh, in a graduate journalism program in which, in, a, in effect, he was arguing for women's equality with men from the Quran. He was charged with blasphemy, sentenced to death. I, t I like to tell my students about this because it's an example of how you can really get in trouble if you write a bad paper. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that wasn't an Arab joke, that was a, a Tom Ford joke. So the, the point is, I think we're, I, I hope we're in agreement here. What we may disagree on, and I'll, and I'll leave it with this, is whether it is really in the interest of the United States to do this. I mean, this is what I like to focus on. Should we be doing this? I think we don't do it terribly well, but I think we should be doing it because it is in our interest. Now, this makes some people flee into the forest. He's talking about interests. He's talking about American security. That means military force. Will Edmode and I see him out there. We, we got into a big fight in the, in the imminent frame over this very issue, the issue of the securitization of American international religious freedom policy. I'm sorry, countries have interests. My argument is that it's in our interest for Egypt to succeed and it won't do it without religious freedom. I don't know if you agree with that you, statement look, of American I mean, interests or I, you not. You know, I'm very committed to the, I mean, I think the essay in the, uh, in, in the book on, on that the Muslim author wrote is very consistent with my own uh, Abdullah Saeed. Yeah, uh, uh, my own views and understandings. I mean, I think they're, they're uh, I mean, there's, these are really debated issues now, and I think a lot of uh, uh, people in the West don't understand that within the Muslim community, most of these great teaching institutions have been destroyed. And so really solid intellectual uh, rigor now in the is Islamic scholastic tradition is limited to a very few places. I mean, Turkey fortunately still has very real uh, scholastic tradition and Turkey, I think they're really grappling with a lot of these issues. And, uh, but you know, I, I think these have to be solved within the Islamic framework. If they're not, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to cause, I think, much more harm than good. And, th and that's why I think it's very important in terms of empowering the Muslims themselves. Uh, and, th and this has to be done. This is what I'm committed to, certainly, because uh, the, the, I, I just read there's an article uh, on Islam and apostasy on Wikipedia where they actually quote a book saying that it's agreed upon that anybody that leaves Islam is to be uh, sentenced to death, and then it's preferable that the imam carries out the, uh, the uh, th which is absurd, and then, and if they can't do it, any Muslim could do it with no legal ramifications. And this is with a citation and a quote on, on Wikipedia. There's no foundation whatsoever for that. This issue is a, 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 a uh, it's, it's, there's disagreement on the issue. There's early scholars that were opposed to it. Rarely were apostasy laws ever implemented uh, historically. This is well known. Uh, one of the great poets uh, of Islam, uh, Abu Alan Ma'arri, complete uh, atheist naturalist in the, in the line of Lucretius, who uh, was very opposed to religion, 
um, and wrote poems about his uh, being opposed to religion, lived to the ripe old age of, I think, 89 in Halab in Syria. I think they left him alone because he was such a great poet, and the Arabs really appreciate great poetry. But you shouldn't have to be a great poet to be free from religious persecution. Do you think, if I could, um, do you think there's any, you mentioned, and I, I think anybody who's worked in the State Department would appreciate your comment, leave me alone, don't send me over there as a State Department uh, functionary because it will ruin my message. But is there anything the State Department can do, perhaps more obliquely, and here I'm not speaking of covert operations, but are there ways to empower existing actors, in your view? That I think one of the ways is to um, fr free up a lot. Like, for instance, now, uh, people that traditionally donated money to support institutions and things, all of that has dried up because they're so afraid now of having their assets frozen <laughs> by the State Department. Uh, you know, so th this big problem, especially in the Gulf states, I mean, they're really paranoid about uh, helping anybody that's doing these things. I mean, Dr. Ramadan uh, recently um, opened up a center uh, in in Qatar. So Qatar's, you know, they've they've been doing quite a bit. But I, I think in t you know, I think the State Department, this administration has a lot of Muslims now uh, working. I mean, not to scare anybody, you know, because there's you know there's certain people that think yeah exactly that's what we've been saying all along, you know. But I mean, this this administration has uh, empowered a lot of young Muslims, and there's an incredible amount of talent in this young Muslim community. Uh, so I think it's very important, and I think these are going to be the best spokespeople uh, uh, for this idea of pluralistic society, which we have to we have to move towards. I mean, w w we should all be committed to this. On the other hand, uh, you know, a lot of what the Muslim world sees as pluralism is pornography becoming a norm, you know, all these things, and and we know. Now with the internet, which has changed everything in the Muslim world, obviously, but it, a lot of people are unaware of the fact that a lot of these terrorists were actually addicted to pornography, and this has been proven now uh, again and again. And and some of them came to the West, uh, had uh, you know sexual relations out of wedlock with uh, Western women, and then they have their born again experience and suddenly felt defiled by the West, like the West has defiled me, and then somehow I have to self-immolate to, to restore my purity. So we're dealing with some really deep uh, uh, problems in terms of, of, uh, of what's going on, this cognitive dissonance that is, is very profound in a lot of these young people. Um, in the Gulf states, I know for a fact from friends who grew up, uh, you know, pornography is a very common thing amongst the young men, which is deeply problematic for the women. And I know the Witherspoon Institute has been at the forefront, and I participated in that extraordinary conference in Princeton, you know, at the forefront. This is another issue. The social costs. Of <laughs> yeah, the social costs of pornography, you know. So this is, they see that's one of the exports of this quote unquote, you know, religious freedom means freedom to fornicate. Right. You know, so right. that, that's the other thing is the, the, the undermining of the, the local values. I mean, I would just respond to that, that to me, this is a, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We, the, yeah. Well, the, the, this to me is the French model. I mean, it's not. Right. I'm not blaming the French for pornography, although <laughs> there's probably something there. But yeah, the laicists. But but it's the notion that religion has got to get out of the public conversation. It, it, the Witherspoon conversation, the social cost of pornography, was not a religious book, but it was. Uh, you know, there there are religious voices so that can talk against pornography and so forth. So the notion of Pushing Islam out of the public conversation is, I'm sure, part of the perception as well that we need to overcome. Great. I just wanted to make sure the audience had some time to ask questions. Uh, I'll start with Daniel. Oh. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, Ed, I actually wanted to engage you. Um, recently, uh, this guy Samuel Raskoff wrote a wonderful thing for Stanford Law Review. Uh, and then it became a New York Times op-ed called Uncle Sam is No Imam. You may have seen that recently. And it was very interesting. His argument was that counter-radicalization under Obama is posing religious freedom threats to American Muslims because it's seeking to establish what he refers to as an official Islam. 
overseas and here. And so I want you to comment a bit about the NYPD spy scandals and your thinking about, and his argument really was that we, we uh, have borrowed this from Britain and it failed under their prevent program because it took this kind of big tent approach where the state was trying to sort of say normative things about a particular religion. So now we have people in Homeland Security talking about jihad to police officers and this is sort of them defining it. Um, and so I wonder if you see that as a threat to religious freedom, this, this approach of counter-radicalization. And anyone else can comment, too. Um, I think it's too early to tell that the British experience has failed. Uh, I think it's fair to say that because of British state funding being available, some of the most luminous Muslim scholars from countries such as Mauritania, Yemen, Pakistan, and elsewhere have been able to tour parts of the UK and meet ordinary Muslims that would ordinarily not have access to those minds. So, you know, that's a huge plus. But that's not to say that the British model is therefore applicable here in the US. And the, the question that the government uh, arbitrates which form of Islam is acceptable or not acceptable is without any doubt a violation of ordinary Muslims' understanding of what their faith ought to be. But all of that said, I'm not an American, and um, I'd be loath to be interfering in what the, either the NYPD is doing with American Muslims or how American Muslim leaders have responded to it. And again, I think it's perhaps best for either Asma or Sheikh Hamza to respond to the, the developments here within the U.S. Uh, you know, I mean, I would just say preemptive law force, um, you know, historically that was the role of the FBI to do that. So it's very interesting that the... the um, you know, these local police forces now are being asked to do this kind of preemptive, which is a very slippery slope, I think, into police state activity. And I think Americans should be really concerned about this because it might be the Muslim community and everybody says, okay, they're just checking out the Muslims. But once, uh, go ahead, somebody's going to object to that, maybe, I don't know. But, I mean, I, I personally, uh, I think it's very problematic. I think probable cause is uh, is one of the foundations of our uh, the Bill of Rights, the you know search and seizure, all all, all of those bills, uh, Bill of Rights were 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 put there to protect you know citizens from having uh, uh, these these foundational rights protected. The only other footnote I'd add to this is you know there are two aspects to a terrorist act. One is the intent, and two is the ability to uh, you know materialize that intent. Now many of these guys on Facebook pages and um, web chat rooms are committed to X, Y, and Z, you know, terrorist act. That, that, that doesn't amount to more than a New Year's wish list. But who's materializing them and saying, well, you know, here's the bomb, go ahead, brother, and, you know, blow up A, B, or C military base. Often that tends to be the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. So the, the you know, the, the materialization of that intent comes back to um, the law enforcement agencies, and I think that's questionable. And again, here I think there's worth something, uh, taking something from the British model, and that is when people have appeared on the British model's prevent radar that there is an individual in a mosque who is trying to recruit people to commit a terrorist act or to uh, glorify Osama bin Laden as a martyr or a great sheikh of Islam, once that's happened in British mosques, to the credit of the British government, they've set up a program where other Muslims Imams and others can take this individual aside and uh, subject them to what you might call counseling and therefore injecting doubt in that mindset. Uh, so, you know, using religion to counter religious extremism has been a more successful model rather than, uh, you know, egging on this individual to then say, well, here's the gun, here's the trigger, here's the bomb, go ahead, do your deed. The bomb doesn't go off. Now you're, a, you know, you're in, 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 in a courtroom in the dock. Because that then sort of uh, undermines trust between Muslim communities and law enforcement agencies that prevents further tip-offs that should be coming from Muslim communities because they are you know, American citizens and they're committed to the safety of the homeland. And Muslims have consistently reported in mosques when they've heard things that have troubled them. And the FBI has ample evidence for this, that citizens just acting out of their own volition you know, have come forward when, when, when they've seen something that troubled them or they thought it was suspicious. I would just like to offer that as a, as a policy idea, that <clears throat> the way, to, in a sense, to remove American government hand from these kinds of activities is just, I mean, this is an amazing thing to me that we're so clueless. We could dramatically expand with a little bit of money, student exchanges, scholar exchanges, professional exchanges, from Americans to Islamic societies around the world, from Islamic societies to American universities, uh, I see in my own university the richness and the and, and the, the, the just 
the learning that takes place when American students interact with Muslim students from around the world and vice versa, and why aren't we doing more of this? I mean, it just strikes me as just amazing that we, it's such a cheap thing to do. Well, and, I think, uh, I mean, just really to dovetail on that, the Saudi Arabia, I know personally that so most Saudi Arabians had a love affair with this country, and they felt after 9-11 like that it was unrequited, they were jilted lovers. I mean, they really did, because many of them studied visas, in this country, come, and here. suddenly they're being, all of them are being accused of terrorism because 15 out of the 19 hijackers were from, and they would say, yeah, and they're from a region that I'm not from. They were from the south. I'm from, I'm from the Hijaz. <laughs> we would never do that. <laughs> I mean, this is the mentality, you know, really. The tribe, they were tribal people, not, no <laughs> one. But Jennifer Bryson from Witherspoon tells a very interesting story of you know young Saudi Salafis coming to the U.S. and then going and meeting the Amish in Pennsylvania, thinking we're very similar. You know, what do we essentially have against the U.S. if the U.S. is home to the Amish that have long beards and uh, everything else that comes with the religious literalism? So you know, there are commonalities there that can play on. We did one program. I took them to uh, Michael Ratner uh, and Barbara Oshansky, who are these two people that do. Uh, civil rights, and they were the lawyers representing the Guantanamo people. They're both Jewish. She's, she is actually half Palestinian, half Jewish. It's, you know, interesting combination. But, uh, Michael Ratner is a Jewish scholar from Colombia, and we interviewed them, and, and this Saudi, young Saudi man asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I come from a Jewish tradition, and we have this idea of the Zadik, who's this truthful person that has to stand up for justice. We came out of there, and they were the I, these Saudi. You know, there's three of them with me, four, and and they were just like, it was. He told me this is a paradigm shift for me, the idea that you could have a Jewish person committed to justice. I mean, we we this is laughable for us, but this is the reality on the ground for a lot of these young people, and and that is the way to reach a lot of these people is just. Uh, getting to know people. You know, the Quran says that we made you peoples and, and communities to get to know one another, not to hate one another. And so that is, is, you know, that is the best way, I think, to do that. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And to vie one with another in virtue. In virtue, vie yeah. in virtue, right. yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions here. And one of them says, please elaborate on the need for a clear lexicon um, he's, re he's referring to a language that's um, used today that would not add fuel to the fire of terrorism, lack of religious freedom, etc. Uh, the person clarified, instead of using words like Islamist or jihadist, are there other words that we can use, such as militants or criminal acts of violence? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I mean, this is one of the great, there's a scholar in Morocco that wrote a book called The Crises of Terminology. Uh, which is 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 endemic uh, everywhere, and then the fact that we don't define our terms anymore. Traditionally, in the in the scholastic tradition, both in the Islamic and Christian world, you have to be able to define any term you used to make sure the interlocutor knew exactly what you were saying. So, if we say religious freedom, define your distinguo, you know, define your term, and and so I think just defining terms is just really important. But for instance, the word in Arabic that they use for fundamentalists is usuliyun which is one of the highest words in the Islamic tradition, and they've reduced it to, they took fundamentalism, and, and they used it. So the usuli scholar is the, is the constitutional theorist in Islamic tradition. So now the word usuli means extremist. And, and this is a problem. We see this uh, again and again. Jihadists, another, jihad is a very high term for Muslims. It's not a negative term, but it's, it's been completely put in a negative light. In the same way that crusade is a very positive term on our side of the pond, and, and yet, in the Arab world, if you translate crusade, because we don't see the cross in crusade anymore, if you go into a dictionary and see the etymology, you'll see cross. We don't see that. But in Arabic, it's harib, uh, harb salibiya, which is a war of the cross. And so when, they, when Bush said, this is a crusade, when it was translated into Arabic, it said, hadihi harb salibiya. You know, and so he's using a relatively neutral term in our culture. But when it was translated into Arabic, it's, it became a religious uh, term of war. He's declaring religious war on the Muslims. And, and these are real problems that we have in, in interpretation, translation. I mean, so much is lost 
in translation. I, I told one of the State Department people, we were talking about tribes in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula. He didn't even know that Beni Tamim, which rules Qatar, is a traditional rival tribe of Rabi'a, which rules Saudi Arabia. Like they've had a, a 2,000 year rivalry. I mean, there, there's poetry about this rivalry, you know. And so, even though they, you know, they work together, they're part of the Gulf's things. They're they're mudari, and these are, uh, you know, of another ilk from Rabi'a. So, and they, and these are still important in those parts of the world. So, it's really just freedom of strategy of the Emir of Qatar to, uh, you know, <laughs> undermine. The tribe well, of the there's Saudis. definitely digs. It's digs, definitely like, see, digs. We're doing better you know. than you are. <laughs> So I have a question on my own. Uh, maybe Tom and Alan can, can answer this. Um, Tom has spoken about when we speak about religious freedom um, to people, to Muslims in the Muslim majority countries, to not phrase it and to make sure that they understand that it's not about a separation of church and state in a way that religion is not allowed to have a vibrant space in the public square. But instead to show this, using the American model, that there is a space for religion. Um, and to that end, I know I was, I was reading some work by, by Monica Duffy Toft, one of the scholars of the Religious Freedom Project, and she has said there's three potential models of religious freedom. And the one that she recommended for Arab Spring countries, for instance, was uh, one that understood that Islam is going to play some sort of special role, maybe we can call it dominant role. Um, so can you maybe elaborate a little bit on how Islam can play that role while, while we still have um, a robust religious freedom in these countries? Well, uh I guess I would respond to that by pointing out that we, and by we I mean the American diplomatic establishment, are confused about what it is we mean when we say promoting religious freedom. And uh, some, many perhaps, are separationist. I wrote an article once, I think for the public discourse, why our American diplomats are French. Here I go again. <laughs> By which I meant, they, in promoting religious freedom, they think they are moving religion out of the public square. I don't think this is any longer among our elites is the model of American religious freedom, religion in the public square. I believe that uh, lots of American elites are, are, are Rawlsians. They're simply trying to move it out. They make the argument that democracy cannot work with religion in the public square. You can't have religious people making uh, religious arguments in the public square. You have problematic things like Catholic bishops getting in the way of uh, contraception availability. So get them out of the way. That is the American elite proposal to the Muslim world. But in fact, we have a far richer story to tell, but we don't tell it. So uh, I think there's massive confusion here. And if we got our ducks in order, we might be a little bit more effective. Alan? Well, yeah, I mean, we, <clears throat> we need to understand, in a sense, our own tradition, our own legacy, our own, our own story, which was, in fact, not a story of dramatic separation of faith from political values. But throughout American history, in fact, this may be the way to do it, that throughout American history, the great reform movements, movements that expanded rights and, and, and reform society and so forth, were infused by religious people, driven by their religious motivations. Uh, and, um, uh, <clears throat> and so to the extent that we can, you, know, you might say, tell that story, um, we convey something very different. And I think the prime example is the civil rights movement. I mean, if you want a story that has salience, in a sense, you know, right now in the Arab Spring, it would be uh, the church-based, religiously infused and inspired movement of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to confront naked segregation and oppression and do so from the standpoint of, of holding up human dignity and the rights of, of all people, as, as Robbie George today spoke about Dr. King's work. And, and in fact, you know, it's very interesting. Zainab al Suwaj of the American Islamic Congress actually translated into Arabic the comic book on the Montgomery bus boycott and the model of civil disobedience to confront oppression. And this was several years ago and distributed that widely in Cairo and throughout the, the Arab world. And I have often wondered, you know, did that plant some seeds? Because that was a, that was a model of religiously informed, infused, inspired activism by Americans who did not leave their religion at the public, at the civic, uh, you know, when they entered the civic space. 
So we have, we have that kind of a story to tell, and, and we don't have to tell it. I wanted to make one, I, I forgot this, I wanted to make one point about congruence theory, which I think is, to me, is, is a really, it's like an E equals MC squared in terms of government in, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, the fundamental premise is that governments work to the degree with which the, 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 uh, the approach of government is replicated in the other social systems, right? And one of the things that, because the Muslim world has been very autocratic for quite some time, you have autocratic families very often, you have autocratic schools, you have autocratic, um, even hospitals. Like, you, you know, here, people, they drive doctors crazy because they've read everything on Google about what they have, and they go in and they say, well, maybe you should use this drug. And, you know, <laughs> whereas in the Arab world, you don't, you know, or the Muslim world in general, you don't question authority in that way. And, uh, teachers, uh, I have a, a friend from one of the Arab countries, I won't say w which one, once said, asked why um, pig was uh, considered unclean, which is one opinion, it's not all the opinions, but he asked that question and he said the teacher went up to him and just whacked him so hard uh, that he never asked another question for the rest of the time that he was in school. And so I think if we're going to, if we really want to see uh, a real transformation. We have to acknowledge that there has to be transformation in terms of the child rearing. Uh, I mean, there needs to be a lot of, of deep-seated changes. It's not simply going to become from one area, but it needs to be a more holistic approach uh, to, to the whole problem. And religious freedom is, is part of that, because the idea of allowing the other to have an opinion is part of, of a, a democratic idea, you know, that, that you're entitled to your opinion. I might disagree with you, but you're entitled to it. And, and so encouraging that, which is part of the early Islamic tradition. I mean, the ikhtilaf al rai ishtihad, this, this was, you know, really, and they had debates with atheists, and I mean, these are famous things that Muslims are proud of, Abu Hanifa debating atheists, and they didn't all kill the atheist. I mean, the stories always have the religious guys winning, uh, but nonetheless, they, they had the debates. <laughs> Um, so according to their program, we're supposed to end right now, but we actually have some leeway, so we'll take another 30 minutes. Um, or another few minutes, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Pat Smith. Um, first comment as far as, it, in, and not, not in depth, but for the uh, consideration of NYPD, um, there is a perspective to take in mind what first responders have to do in, in, across the board. And, and that is an area for reflection as well. Um, for the panel, um, Egypt was, and I don't want to be a pessimist by any means, but Egypt was mentioned as a case study. Um, what makes you think by broadening the perspective to, incru to include discussions on greater religious freedom that you'd have any more success than what has recently occurred with the uh, democracy forums, the democracy NGOs that were just arrested or just released or allowed to travel the last few days when American State Department or finance projects, NDI, IRI, um, International Republican Institute and, and National Democratic Institute, and in their probably non-religious aspects of trying to promote political democracy learning. And you gentlemen are probably more informed of the, the, the uh, immediate issues involved in Cairo, but uh, to the point where, what, who was it, uh, the, the son of Rayla Hood was, was one of the charged individuals. So what gives you, and, and could you comment on, why should we think that if you broaden the discussion to include religious liberty, that you're going to have a different impact than what we're trying to do in areas of, of political democracy as we're already sponsoring? Well, it's a good question. Um, in my view, you know, it, it, the problem here is that we have not been engendering this conversation within Egypt all along. Presumably, you know, we've been spending to the tune of $2 billion a year for roughly 30, 30 years. Um, we have done this with the assumption that we were building civil society that we were building uh, human rights and other organizations. Um, and in fact, uh, it, it may turn out, if an audit is done, that some of this money was not uh, placed. But, but some of it has done 
uh, some good. And in fact, I think you're referring to the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, and I think it was the IRI or the NDI that LaHood's son was working at who was arrested. So you, you say, what makes me think we can succeed when this has failed? This is the problem of democracy. Uh, I have no confidence that we can succeed. I'm only making the argument that it is in our interest that they succeed, and if they continue to act in this fashion, they won't. They will fail. I think there are plenty of Egyptians who understand that. And I think that some of the critics of this kind of uh, activity can come from within the Muslim community in Egypt. Um, I think these are authoritarian groups that are just uh, clamping down. I think this is a sign that Egyptian democracy is slowing down, but it's in our interest to, to do everything we can to stop it. But we're not puppet masters. Also the difference <laughs> is between Egypt, if I could just say this, Ed, Egypt and Iraq and Afghanistan, is that those countries can say we've the United States has tried to impose something on them. Uh, we were, you know, we did not uh, stimulate what has happened happening in Egypt, unless you want to make the argument that our $60 billion had some kind of effect. Maybe it did. But these people have opted for democracy. We, we need to help them succeed, and I think religious freedom has to play a part in that. Now, yeah. I've been going to Cairo at least on a two-monthly basis over the last 18 months, and every time I've met with various factions and leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, the one argument that actually works with them is the argument of religion. And it works with them because many of them have spent the last 40, 45 years calling for an Islamic state. And now that the chance has come to create this so-called Islamic state, they don't actually know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it means. They don't know how it's to be materialized. And I found them to be most receptive when they look <coughs> towards their religious counterparts, as it were, in Europe, the, you know, Christian Democrats, social Democrats, and dare I say here in the US, those who are inspired by religion-based politics. Um, and there might be a, a model there for people who, who've embraced a, a sense of faith-based politics to have open, frank discussions with them, that not to preach, not to be instructive, but in a spirit of sharing that results in the more quote-unquote moderate factions of the Muslim Brotherhood winning over the more, again, quote-unquote extremist factions of the Muslim Brotherhood because there are various factions within and they are on an experiment and they are on a journey and the least we could do is actually help them on the journey rather than hammer them and say you're all Muslim Brotherhood people and once upon a time you're extremists and therefore you still remain extremists which seems to be a strand of thought uh, here in Washington if I may say so um, but the reality is they are in power and the reality is they're on a journey and it's an ideal opportunity why now uh, and to respond to that point because they're about to write the constitution in Egypt right. Well, I mean, and the worst, worst case scenario for the religion is that religious states are created. I mean, I, it'll do more harm to the religious uh, faith of the people than anything else. Uh, Iran is a case study. I mean, people were very enthusiastic about the freedoms of getting rid of the Shah, and they got, Savak went back into operation, but just with a different name. And, and uh, I heard one of the, uh, I won't, you know, he's a Islamist, I heard him uh, he, he was put in charge of security at, um, uh, in Iraq, and he started arguing how torture was necessary. You know? and, and it was actually uh, the, uh, Pickering, I think, the ambassador, who made the argument against it. You know? So even though these, these were the very people that were tortured uh, prior to that, you know, then when they get into power, and I think this is, this is a real problem for religion. Uh, the best thing, historically, Muslim scholars have always stayed away from the religion because they've seen religion as something that confronts uh, power and should remind power should, in the American sense of our historical sense, mm -hmm. you know, uh, speaking truth to power. But the idea of religious people taking power Power corrupts, and it certainly corrupts religious people just like it corrupts everybody else. Sure. Well, I mean, that's the American founding understanding, as yeah. you say. And if that could be grasped politically in any of these countries, I think it would be well, because Turkey, religion becomes yeah. part of civil society putting yeah. limits exactly, on government. Exactly, yeah. And I think Turkey's grappling with this very issue yeah. now. They're really, because they have been successful um, economically through a secular model. Yeah. And yet the religious, the, uh, the political leadership now definitely has very strong Islamic sentiments, but they're, they're grappling now with this balance. And, uh, and it's, it's going to be very interesting. And, and now the, in the Arab states, the, the, a lot of the Islamists are recognizing the superiority of the nonviolent uh, Turkish model over the traditional 
violent model that has emerged out of uh, political uh, Islam that was really coming to an end, unfortunately. And 9-11 revived the whole thing. I mean, we were actually happy that it was finally coming to an end. And 9-11 and just revived the whole thing because of our uh, responses. You know, it just it reinvigorated a lot of these people that had really lost any credibility and voice. That's a question right there. Uh, thank you. In light of the need for broader uh, interfaith and interfaith, we also didn't talk about interfaith now, but there's a broader need for interfaith with which I think you alluded to, uh, Mr. Hussein. Uh, there's a broader need for intrafaith. But I was wondering, in light of all of that, can you elaborate on the, speaking of a model, speaking on the Medina Constitution and the religious freedom that existed during that time of Prophet Muhammad? Are you talking to, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the Medina Constitution was an attempt uh, at creating a, and uh, uh, there's a recent book by Danner about this. He's a very exceptional Islamic scholar, Christian background here, uh, wrote a book about this, um, that it really was an attempt at creating a pluralistic state. And I think one of the reasons why Muslims historically have tried to accommodate other religions, and there's a checkered history. I mean, I, one of my uh, friends, he's a professor of Islamic history, tells his believing students, take a lot of faith vitamins before you read Islamic history, you know, because, um, you know, we forget that history is, is the history of the ego. It's not the history of the tradition itself. It's the history of the tradition's ego. So when you study Catholic history, you have to be aware of that. Catholicism is St. Thomas Aquinas. It's, it's, it's Augustine. It's not what, what they did when they were persecuting people. These, these are the egos of religion. I think people conflate the two. They tend to forget that. But historically, the Muslims really did uh, uh, protect these churches. I mean, the, the Church of the Sepulchre that was uh, uh, destroyed in the 11th century was burnt down by a madman. And everybody recognized him as mad. It was immediately rebuilt by the following caliph. Uh, but the, you know, historically, the Christians uh, have have uh, have been a protected community. It's certainly I would agree with Tom Farr that the United States has achieved a level of religious freedom that I think is unparalleled uh, in in human history. Uh, and and uh, and but I really think if people read Islamic history, they're quite shocked to find uh, in relation to other places in the world. And the other we have to give the Hindus also. The Hindus historically have been an extremely um, uh, tolerant of other communities, as well as the Jewish uh, tradition, uh, certainly for Noahidic peoples. Um, Buddhism has a checkered past also. I mean, Buddhism now has the best PR in terms of any of the religions. But if you study, there's a, the clause of the Buddha is an interesting study on violence in the Buddhist tradition, historically. And when the, when the Buddhists retook Afghanistan uh, after it had been conquered by the Muslims, when they retook it, um, they slaughtered all the Buddhists that converted to Islam. And this is a historical fact. So um, the Buddhists have not always been the most peaceful practitioners. I mean, these are, these are all uh, the tragic history. And unfortunately, our history in terms of religious freedom is, is far more negative than it is positive. But we do have these bright spots in the Christian tradition. We have Roger uh, in Sicily and Frederick II. We have the con 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 conviviality that occurred in Spanish uh, 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 history of Muslims, Jews, and Christians living together. And, and we have the United States model, which is it's a stunning model. I mean, we, we're, we're renting, from, uh, as a Muslim college, we're re renting from a Baptist seminary. <laughs> so it's Berkeley. You, you so. know, that, <laughs> and you know, I, it's I Berkeley Baptist. That, that, <laughs> that point, once again, I think underscores how valuable it is to have exchanges. You know, the, uh, I don't know if the State Department's still doing this, but there used to be a program where young leaders in various societies were brought to the United States, traveled they around. Do They're still yeah. doing that. And you know, FW, the clerk was one of those. Right. And, and the experience of being in the United States and seeing race relations, bad as they were, but nonetheless, convinced him that apartheid was doomed. I mean, he just understood. And, and I just am struck with what happens on college campuses, um, and, and what happens when, when, peop, when Muslims from around the world come and actually see their mosques in America and they're devout Muslims and that actually Americans are religious, which is another interesting myth, right? That, that we are perceived around 
the world as fundamentalist in the fundam Muslim world. As, yeah. fun as basically very secular, yeah. hedonistic, materialistic, shallow. And when, when Muslims come and actually find out that, oh, Americans actually ha are believers, some of them, and they have churches and temples and mosques and so forth, that's a delightful surprise. Is that, is that accurate? I, you know, I think it, it goes both ways. I think there's, there, there is, uh, Tim Winter recently wrote an article about the fact that a lot of Muslims view uh, the United States uh, government policies as kind of really fanatical religious policies. Certainly under the Bush administration, that was the view in a lot of places. So I, I, think, mm -hmm. I think it goes both ways. Yeah. There's definitely the, the hedonistic idea that, um, you know, that everybody's practicing uh, kind of a West Coast hedonistic um, stop coming from the West Coast. I can speak with authority. Um, you know, this kind of hedonistic uh, culture. But... Um, yeah, they're quite shocked, and I think they're, m most of the Muslims I know that have been to the U.S., they always say, Sha'ab Tayyib, Sha'ab Matiyab. They always have these accolades to talk, their experience with the American people generally was very surprising, but then they always say, oh, but the government. Yeah. It's always the caveat. You know, one of the great ironies of the perception that the evil Bush sent uh, Marines in with backpacks full of Bibles into right. Iraq uh, is that it's, it's not true. The, the, the neocons, who you can laud or condemn for constructing our policy in Iraq, were and are very secular right. thinkers. Yeah. They had no clue that they were moving into a very religious society, which I think is somewhat ironic, given the fact that I think you're quite right. There is some perception out there that it, that it uh, particularly under the Bush administration, that it was just this religious Fanaticism. Fanaticism that, that led the United States into yeah. Iran. All right. Well, with that, I've been asked to, to bring this to a close. Um, thank you. Thank you. Very much.